All right, so how does this compare to the non-pacemaker action potential? Well, the first big thing is there's no automaticity, right? So, you know, these cells, there needs to be some external stimuli. So, for example, if I have a bunch of, you know, cardiac myocytes here, right? So here's a bunch of my cardiac myocytes next to each other. There has to be an action potential that comes into one of these cells, right? One of these cells has to have an action potential for it to eventually cause depolarization to this cell and then this cell. Right, so it's not like the automaticity where automatically it doesn't matter if there's an action potential nearby in the SA node, the SA node is still going to depolarize automatically because of the funny current and the T and L type calcium channels. Whereas with these non pacemaker cells, there needs to be some kind of external stimulus. There's no automaticity here. Again, with these cells, there's five phases, technically zero to four, and the phase four is a resting potential phase. We didn't have a resting potential phase when we looked at the pacemaker cells, right? The pacemaker cells, there is no resting potential, but there is automaticity. Okay, so let's go through this. So again, phase four is a resting memory potential, again, different from what we saw uh, previously. This was a, pacing, a pacemaker potential in the pacemaker cell. And resting potentials are largely gonna be associated with outward potassium current, why is that? Well, remember, if you go back to that neurology video I was talking about, the resting membrane potential of potassium, right, it's gonna be around negative 90 millivolts. Okay, so it's gonna be way down over here. Okay, this one says negative 96. But, I mean, just to give you an idea, you're gonna have a very negative resting membrane potential of potassium. So if there's only permeability to potassium, you would expect your resting membrane potential to be quite low. And so that's why at the resting membrane potential, we have an outward, cur outward potassium current. All of these fast sodium channels and L-type calcium channels, they're closed at this time, right? If they were open, you probably wouldn't have a resting potential so low. If you're really kind of looking into the details again here, you might be saying, okay, why is this resting memory potential so low? Because with skeletal muscle, you know, my resting memory potential might have been negative 75, for example. So why is it that in skeletal muscle, my resting memory potential is here, but with you know, ventricular myocytes, it's a little bit lower. The idea here is this is kind of like a safety protective mechanism. So in ventricular myocytes, you have to generate a higher action potential to kind of get you out of this hole to eventually depolarize. Okay, so the idea here is you don't want the ventricular myocytes depolarizing for any stimuli that comes along because all of a sudden now you're in an arrhythmia, right, which could technically be very lethal. So the idea here is you have a lower resting membrane potential in ventricular myocytes because it's going to take more stimulus to cause an action potential. Okay, so the threshold usually for depolarization is going to be at about minus 70 millivolts. So let me write that in here. So about minus 70 millivolts. Once that threshold is reached, right, if you have some other cells nearby that are undergoing an action potential, they'll help depolarize this to minus 70. So once you get to minus 70, now you go through your all or none action potential. And so this is going to be phase zero, which remember, if we go back to the pacemaker cells, that was the same thing. Phase zero was when we had the depolarization. So this is your action potential depolarization. And again, it's not automaticity. It begins with depolarization from action potential set adjacent cells. And this depolarization, this is probably the most high yield point on this slide, is largely driven by sodium. Okay, so there's increased permeability of inward fast sodium current. Now, this is where it can get tricky. Remember, the fast sodium current, okay, so the fast sodium current is used for depolarization of non-pacemaker cells. So this is what the fast sodium current is doing. And this is, you know, no surprise, right? So we have skeletal muscle cells, we have nervous tissue, and those cells depolarize using sodium current, right? So sodium channels, fast, rapid depolarization. So this is pretty similar to what we normally see in the other areas of the body. However, remember the slow sodium current, this is associated with those funny channels, the IF channels. Okay, so the slow funny current is going to be associated with the early depolarization, the early depolarization of pacemaker cells. And this is gonna be, remember, phase four, and this depolarization is phase zero, okay? So I know that's kind of tricky, but you do wanna make sure you're clear on the difference between the slow sodium channels with the pacemaker potentials and the fast sodium channels because they are completely different, right? The slow sodium channels are responsible for automaticity. The fast sodium channels are gonna be responsible for this rapid depolarization of the cardiac myocytes. All right, so then we get to phase one here, which we didn't see this phase one and phase two in the last slide. So phase one is early repolarization. So you get this little kind of dip 
here in the membrane potential. A little bit of hyperpolarization, but not very much. And during this stage, all of these rapid sodium channels that were responsible for depolarization, you're gonna get some closure and some inactivation of those. And so the combination of this outward potassium current, right, with the closure of these channels, the inactivation, you get this little dip. Now, as this dip starts to happen, all of a sudden, all of these calcium channels start to open. Okay, so all of these L-type calcium channels start to open. And the idea here is, you know, you, got, you kind of picture this as saying, okay, look, I have this membrane, right? And I have these potassium channels here, and I have these calcium channels here. And let's say this is the inside of my cell, and this is the outside. So in the beginning of this phase, what's happening is, okay, in phase one, we got some potassium leaving. That gives me this little downslope. But then what happens is in phase two, all of a sudden now, as I start to have some of this potassium leave, I suddenly have this rush of calcium coming in to compensate for this potassium leaving. And so that's this section of the curve here. So potassium is leaving and calcium is coming in and those charges, that difference in charge is gonna be balanced during this region of the curve here. And so you have this sustained higher level of membrane potential. And this is the area where you're gonna have your ventricular contraction. Okay, so this is gonna be where ventricular systole is occurring. Now, technically, if you're, again, getting technical, I like to keep things simple. You know, you're not gonna get super detailed into the physiology here for most step one questions, but technically, the, the L-type calcium channels that are open during this, you know, plateau phase, as we call it, because, you know, you're evening out your membrane potential here, this plateau phase, these, cal these calcium channels actually start to open somewhere back over here around minus 40, okay? And then there's more and more and more, and then eventually you're gonna have a rush of them balancing this potassium efflux. So it's not 100% true to say that they open in the plateau phase, but for all intensive purposes for board exam questions, I would remember that the L-type calcium channels balancing the potassium outward current is what is responsible for the plateau phase. That's what I would remember. And you don't get this plateau phase in skeletal muscle, you don't get it uh, in you know nervous system action potentials. This is exclusive to this non-pacemaker action potential. And because it's exclusive to this, it makes it so that this particular phase is very high yield. And so I would absolutely remember L-type calcium channels are open and you also have your potassium channels open. And these two currents are going in opposite directions to balance themselves, to give you a plateau phase which is responsible for ventricular contractility, ventricular systole. Finally, you have your repolarization phase, which in this case, we call it a late repolarization. That's just because we had an early repolarization here, but this is kind of like your standard repolarization, again, due to potassium channels opening. Now there's multiple potassium channels. One of the big one is gonna be this delayed rectifier current, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But in general, the concept for you to remember is that you have increased permeability to potassium, again, during hyperpolarization. It's kind of like what you've been seeing this whole time. So this is not anything new. And the other thing that happens is the L-type calcium channels become inactivated. So at this point, when we get to phase three, these calcium channels are now inactivated, okay? So they're basically shutting down and you have all of this potassium that's coming out of the cell via various channels, okay? So there's gonna be various channels that are open that are getting this potassium out and that's gonna cause this rapid hyperpolarization. And that will get you back to your resting membrane potential where we started, where you have this permeability of outward potassium current because we're approaching potassium's resting membrane potential, right? So that's the concept. Now. The other thing to remember is this absolute refractory period. Sometimes it's called the effective refractory period. So this is the time after you go through phase three in which a new action potential cannot be initiated. And during this time, you still have this inactivation of these L-type calcium channels. So remember, you have your P wave, right? And then you have your QRS complex, right? So QRS complex, okay? And then you have your T wave, okay? So this is the QT interval that I, and I tried to color code it there for you. So essentially what's happening is from the initiation of this depolarization, right, you're gonna have this sustained contraction through this region here. So this is where you have ventricular systole, right? And then this repolarization segment is gonna be represented by the T wave. And this whole area is the QT interval. So that's how the QT interval is related to these action potentials. And that's particularly how you'll to remember because in many cases you have to relate something changing the QT interval or changing EKG finding. And then how does that relate specifically to these action potentials?